Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Secrets of Divine Providence, Part 4. Tell your neighbor, Secrets of Divine Providence, Part 4. Speak it a bit faster. Secrets of Divine Providence, Part 4. Hallelujah. So if you have just joined the church, and um, you, ha you didn't have a, you probably have heard part four. That's grammatically meaning there is a part three, two and one. So you speak to the CD guys and get all the parts. They are wonderful. Hallelujah. You will realize that some of the things I'm about to share, if you relate them with the other three parts, it will create a whole picture for you. Hallelujah. And we are not preaching. I repeat things we don't practice. Praise the Lord. We don't live at the masses of men. We work. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We just don't tell you what we do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fourth part is going to be interesting if you have had the three. If you have not had the three, you're going to miss out on a lot of things because there are things I can't address in the other three parts and yet they are already ours that we spent teaching. And that's why I tell people, learn, just learn to listen to the CDs. We have more than eight or nine hundred sermons recorded, clear copies. If you think we're making money out of it, you get a flash, we'll flash it on for you on your hard drive or a flash, USB, anything, free of charge. Because we don't make money off CDs. The Lord is our witness on that. Freely given, freely we give. I don't sell pastors and pastors are, none of those people sell CDs. We intended to make them free. And share the same CDs also. I see people buy funny things, funny devotionals, books. You read the whole devotional the whole week. Shofar devotionals are written every day on WhatsApp world. You have CDs to listen to. Some of you are even reading books that will never take you any, anywhere, but you're just reading. And then you look at the title and you say, eh, this is the heart of Christ, remember reading this. Reading, ripping small by small. <laughs> ripping <laughs> small by small. I spend my hour reading a 300 page book on ripping small by <laughs> Me, I'm ripping big. Tell your neighbor, me, I'm ripping big. Tell him. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, Secrets of Divine Providence, part four. The reason why we're preaching this is because we hate poor Christians. We don't know how to live with them. We are praying for the grace to live with people who are poor deliberately. If we're dealing with an ignorant issue, we're going to deal with that by teaching. But if you know what to do and you are deliberately staying in that position, then we don't know how to work. Praise the Lord Jesus. Christians have been ashamed. You, you know what I mean? You look at a Christian and they're ashamed. But we are claiming all this finished work at the cross at Calvary, the anointing, Holy Ghost, shakarararara. That's why I don't listen to some people. Not in a bad way. No, 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 no. If you don't listen, how can the Lord show you what's going to make me rich, prophet? You who hears God and you're poor. It has to first work in my system. When it works in my system, then I can teach it. If I'm healthy, I can teach healing. If I'm increasing, I can teach increase. If I'm teaching wisdom, I can teach because if I'm having wisdom, I have to teach it. And the other way around. You get it? And therefore we look to producing fruit that echoes out of the seed planted in our spirit. Hallelujah. And the one thing that 
every Christian should not be poor. You, no Christian should be broke. No Christian should beg for tuition. No Christian should ask for house rent. No Christian. Let it be with the uh, Mustafas, but not you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, fourth part. Tell your neighbor fourth part. We'll take our reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. This is, the fourth part is a bit more mature, eh? so it's, you're going to realize it, it's a bit mature, to the mature. The Bible says, one, let's read, uh-huh. There is one glory of the sun, uh-huh, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, uh-huh. For one star differeth from one star in glory. Read it again. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. Uh -huh. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Hallelujah. How many of you attended Christmas service here? You remember that someone I'm a star? So we're talking about stars, Christians, children of God. The Bible has said that there is also a difference in the glory. Okay. Um, simply put, they are rich people, but there is also a difference in wealth. They are clever people, but there is also a difference in cleverness. They are deep preachers, but there is a difference in depth. They are mighty worshippers, but there's also a difference in the level of worship. The principle we try to put in the ministry is that if a man requires, the Bible says, a mastery of things, that man must be temperate in all things. You know, if you want to be the master in your game, you must know the patterns that have to make you the master of what you must do. You get where I'm coming from? If you know that there is a place called mastery or if you know that there has to be a place of the best among the best you must seek to be the best among the best not a mediocre survivor among the best that's why i don't believe in a christianity that survives i believe in a christianity that is above survival i believe in a place where god must deliver you above you thinking i must survive the life of christianity is not a survival feat no it's not a survival experience the life of Christianity is joy unspeakable, full of glory, an increase from glory to glory to the very image and likeness, the full stature, the measure of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is salvation. Praise the Lord Jesus. So if the Bible says now this differs, the stars differ, it means that there's a difference between even the Christians, even in the giving circles, there's a difference between Christians who receive in a certain way and Christians who don't receive in a certain way. We might all tithe, we might all give in the church, but it's going to be people who will get more. They'll receive back more. And that's the essence of the ground. And it says, let's just say all men were doing good. Okay, we're past the place where we're not doing good anymore. We're talking about the seeds. Eh? Some are planted on the rocky ground, some are planted on the stony, uh, stony ground, some are planted on this and that. But it speaks of a place where some have planted on good ground. The Bible says, and of those who plant in good ground are they who hear the word and appropriate it. And then start to produce fruit. But it says, some 30 fold, some 60 fold, some 100 fold. So even in the place of receiving back, some people receive 30 fold, some people receive 60 fold, some people bring forth and 100 fold. Why do you want to bring 30 fold if you can get 100 fold? Why do you want to get 60 if you can get 100 fold? If you're from 30 and 100 is a high order, make all effort to get to 60 and look to 100. You get what I'm trying to tell you? It's like last year I gave my first fruit. This year I increase my first fruit. I intend to do it. And next year I must give more first fruit than I get this year. That's how I work. Why? Because I want to get from a 30-fold experience through a 60-fold experience to a 100-fold experience. You get what I'm telling you? When I started radio program, I got a program of a certain man of God, I started to send checks. You understand? December, the Spirit of the Lord told me double it. I doubled the check. So when somebody says, oh, we're, we're paying radio for Apostle Grace. I am paying radio for another man. You get it? And that radio, paying for another man, gave us free air 
for months on Wava FM, gave us free air on Mighty Fire in the North, and we were paying free. We went to India, and somebody told me they want to air my programs on television for free. But I've been signing checks in the back. You get where I'm from? No man, listen, no man is provided for by accident. It's not there. If they don't have a testimony of manipulation, huh? of course there are those ones who are manipulating people. Hey, 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 hey. Do you understand where I'm coming from? And we've brought shame to the gospel, to the body of Christ, by manipulating men. We've brought shame to the gospel. The gospel became a place of cheap Christians and cheap ministers. The moment a pastor comes into a room, people say, oh, my shaka, Then they start to say, now, ah, our money. That's why we had to change that mindset. When I come at your office, you, you have to be happy. <laughs> because I don't come for money. How many of you have ever visited, if, you, if you're sure, have ever visited, visited your workplace? Put up your hand. Exactly what I'm saying. One pastor. I don't know where. Uh, Bruce? Hey, Bruce, I was bringing a patient because you're a doctor. <laughs> hey, Wesley, because you're a DJ. <laughs> Meaning, I don't visit people's workplaces. They visit my workplace. Not theirs. I don't. You know those pastors who go door to door? <laughs> and they go praying for everyone. No, if you have a shop, I'll come to buy a shirt. Do you understand? says that we don't ascend the gospel. We don't bring shame to the gospel. Hallelujah. So because there is one glory of the sun, one glory of the, of the stars, and the stars define glory, God is trying to say that men who reap 30 fold, others 60 fold, others 100 fold. Now you choose which fold. This is just the essence of the secrets of divine providence, part four. That's why I want you to listen to the three, because the three shift you from zero fold to 30, 60. But this part four is a place that has to get you to 100. You might not be able to get to 100 fold tomorrow. No. There are some people also who are just begotten into 100 fold, just like that, because they know how to appropriate principles. Okay? But, and that's the essence of those three parts, to help you get from glory to glory to this level. That's what I'm saying. For some of you who have been, this is going to be more so for people who have already mastered the principles. But, if you're a smart student, it will work for you if you just adopt from part four. But listen to the other three to get the details of the other things. For example, I spoke about the first fruits, the, 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 the tithing of the faith. Because we're not tithing in the law, it explains how you work in those principles. You know? And, and they, they help. Eh? So, if the Bible has said that the, there is one glory and the different glory, I want a hundredfold. I don't want... 60 fold and I don't want 30 fold. Some people are comfortable with 30 fold. Some people are comfortable with 60 fold. I am not comfortable with that kind of fold. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. And some people aren't comfortable with no fold at all. See, you get it? And that's risky. That's very what? That's risky. That's very risky. Why? Because you see, for those of you who had secrets of mind prayed in part three, you realize, you remember the, 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 the jargon we had called the transfer still takes place? Huh? Whether you say, I'm not going to give, oh, I'm going I'm gonna to give, still the transfer will what? Will take place. Proverbs 13, I think, says that a wise man stores up what? Let's read, 22. Proverbs 13, 22. Give me the uh, Amplified Bible. Let's read it from the Amplified. What does it say? Uh-huh. One, two, three. A good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner, the Bible says, finds its way eventually into the hands of Apostle Grace, for whom it was laid up for. <laughs> What's your name? Yes. You see where I'm coming from? He says that it finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up for. That means there is an inheritance laid up for the righteous. And if you refuse to do principles, the money, your money, will find its way into my pocket. You don't know how, but it will. 
Because either way the transfer has to what? Take place. The guy refuses to say for five years or six years, I don't know. And the scriptures say that um, the ransom of a man's life for his riches. He refuses to release the riches and the principles. And then because it has to ransom for his life, he's afflicted with disease. And disease gets him. He's taken to hospital. And then GlaxoSmithKline eats the money. That is not ignorance. If he knows the principles, that is stupid. Because they that way the principle of transfer will take place. GlaxoSmithKline will probably have an underlying line of doing principles somewhere because nothing survives simply by chance. Then it then happens. And I can prove that. I can prove that. You get it? So you did business, yes, you refused to give your first fruit, you refused to give your tithe, now you're stuck. The business is down, you're indebted, you have to pay the loan. You're paying interest of something you didn't earn in, and you're happy. Why do you put yourself in that state? And that's why I tell Christians, unless God is not your source, unless you have other sources, except Jehovah God, but if Jehovah God is your source, never hesitate to give him your money or anything you have. Living by faith is not just saying I'm going to be healthy. No, living by faith means that I appropriate the word of God pertaining my health. If health says speak, I speak. God has never told you to just speak on money. He said, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, press down, second together, running over shall men give unto your bosom. Whether you want it or not, if you give, men will give you. Don't have a problem with men who are given because they are givers. Have a problem with men who don't give but want to be given. Is that pastor who is not tithing but wants to be tithed to? Is that man of God who wants people to do fast fruit yet his ministry has never done fast fruit? How are you going to reconcile that woman of God or man of God? We tithe as a ministry. We do. And we must increase on that principle. But we're not doing it and we're judging people who are increasing. How? You get what I'm coming from? It just doesn't make sense. You do your homework and we'll get the grade. If you don't do your homework, it's your problem. That's the part that causes the tears and not the eyes in the back end. Whether you want it or not, the same things people must do for it to be a success. But how can you hear these principles every day and you still fail? So whether you want it or not, you look at many Christians' lives who have not done fast fruit or tight. There's just this transfer every morning. Money is leaving them in a certain way. Problems, issues, something is taking it. And then somebody brings that funny head and says, Pastor, I think there's a demon in our family. It just takes money. Which demon? Because there are people who are so demon-centered in every generation. Oh, there's the demon of this, the demon of that, the morning sack of this, the midnight hour, midnight hour, what? The crossing of the night. I was telling about it on radio that day. I said, man, what's wrong with the church today? I have a special prayer, it's at midnight, or oh, at 3 a.m. with no witchcraft is being done. That's the point you should sleep. Because this, if you're doing, if you're praying because guys have, have started to do witchcraft at 3 a.m., it means that you're moving behind the game. You're moving behind the game. Why? Because they go in and then you also go in to counter what they are doing. That's why the principle of the Christian is praying always in the Holy Ghost. It's an always experience. That means the prompting comes in the car. I don't even wait for anybody to know. Some of you have read who come along in the car, you know. Sometimes I'm just driving and then you just, ha, there's this thing I know, Kaparanda, Rebo, Sheila. If I wake up at 1 a.m. in the morning and then, and then uh, the, the toilet is calling, and, and, <laughs> but I, I realize that distance to toilet and back is about 30 minutes or 1 minute or 1 hour. Shakarava, Bakaranda, Zebakala. Always in the Holy Ghost. Remember waiting for the midnight hour. The Bible says that the day was created for man. Man was not created for the day. You can make your day be anything. Some of us are midnight, are not midnight. Because the time you cross through days in the spirit realm, by the timing of the spirit, is different from the way you time your timing. You give your day and night is seasons and times, Genesis 1.14. My day and time is Genesis 1.3. Light and day, they're both days, but they're different. So you say, oh, one day in the house of the Lord is like a thousand in the world. Yes. Why don't you work with his day? Why don't you work with God's day? Don't you see that even the lines of impression of the Holy Spirit still cut in the day of the Lord? 
the prophet says, the Lord showed me a vision. In his day, that vision could not be appropriated in the day of the man. Therefore, if I'm functioning in the day of the spirit, I must produce the results of the day of the spirit, lest I lose it. Or I start to have a slow life in ministry. And that is why people can't explain what is happening, even in this ministry. First day, Panero, 1,200 people. The first day. Why? Because some people believe in beginning small. You know, it began small in a house. You, you get what I'm trying to tell you? We don't want you to begin small in a house. No. No. We want you to begin big. So that by the time they think of testing you, they're like, ah, how do we test who is beginning where we are ending? That's supposed to be our story. That's supposed to be our story. We do business as well. I'm a businessman by profession. I make investment. But when I want to go there and do some investment, I don't want to invest like begin slowly. No. I plant big. That's how they say, hey, Aka, the guy came rich. That's how we are. But for you, Miami, I began small in a street. The key said, 30 fold. It's my 1% fold. No. Begin big. Always begin big. Always begin big. That's who we are. Because there's a portion that we have to have and the same principles that you must learn. Those are the things I'm trying to explain to you. Praise the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So even if you do what? That money will leave you. It might take 20 years. It might take 15 years. It will still leave you. Why? Because whether you want it or not, the righteous state of certain men, you understand? And the principles of righteousness working in their lives. Huh? still appropriate a certain shifting of money to a system. Now, the funny thing with money, because it's a principle, it doesn't even care if the man is born again or not. He will be rich. Bill Gates is the richest man now. About 72 billion last year, beginning January 2015, is 81 billion. Years ago, Bill Gates used to say his principle was giving 40% to the poor. Of his income. In fact, the time Carlos Slim goes up above Bill Gates was because Bill Gates gave a lot. That was the only reason why Carlos Slim went above him during that time. But he has always been up. He has appropriated principles since he was a little boy. He used to tell his teachers, I'm going to be a millionaire one day. And they would laugh. But he was giving principles, tithes, since he was a little boy. He went past tithes. By the time he's the richest man in the world, he's giving 40% of his income. In 2012, he invented a certain program called uh, the, P the Pledge Project with Warren Buffett, which also happens to be the almost the second richest man in the world. And the Pledge Program is a pro program they have as rich people to make sure that by the time they die, they've given up 99% of their wealth. And then they started to go speaking to people about the idea. And then they got 40 billionaires and families in the United States, and all of them have enrolled on that list. The richest billionaires in the United States are on the pledge program. They intend to give more than half of their wealth before they die. More than half of their wealth, personally, before they die. You're talking to a Christian to tithe. And he's not tithing, even for God. To bring last month's tithe. You, you see where I'm coming from? We, we, we met very cheap churches. The sister leading worship is not tithing. Which is also thing. I can't look for a guy who gives big and I just go out with nothing. Of course you go out with something. But 0 0.000%, 1, 0 0.0001 fold. Your health. You don't have flu. You read all these rich guys, the Facebook boys. The Google guys, read all of them. George Lucas, all of those guys. The guy of Ask.com, um, Tana, what, the guy of Warner Bros, the biggest landowner in the world. All of those guys on the pledge list. They are giving more than 50%. You, you're struggling with? Then after you say, richest man in the world, I am rich. You claim your are I am rich. In Jesus' name, I am rich. Landlord comes to do do. <laughs> um, have you had stuck men preaching? You know, there are this. I want to borrow a million things. You know, there are some things which are still stuck. Uh, some I'm supposed to be receiving. Some you're supposed to. 
Christian life is not supposed to live a supposition story. No. He said he shall supply all your needs. He didn't add suppose in the story. No. He said he shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's his story. That's who you are. Now how can the richest man be giving that? And then the Christian is not even tithing. Oh, he's giving a tithe. And then they say, why is Bill Gates rich? And those are the guys who are shaking the world. The CEO of a successful company like Apple stands up and says something and nobody's going to fight it. You go in the back end, Bill Gates owns 40% of Apple as a company. And then we ask ourselves why it had the highest earnings above any mobile telecom in the world. And they don't know that money answers something. Or oh, money answers all things, actually. Because money is a servant. Money is supposed to be a servant. So the Bible says that money answers all things. It means it can answer. You just need to know how to call it. But God is teaching us principles of calling, and we are ignoring them. And the men out there in the world who are not born again are doing the very principles. They're giving billions of dollars in health care. And science programs to fight malaria and AIDS. And then they send those things in our nation and guys embezzle them. <laughs> and then we ask, for 25 years, 28 years, Uganda's been third world. No, 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 no. President Museveni, shut up. Bill gets his wealth alone. They, they say if you get all the wealth of, of Bill Gates and put it together, it would be the 37th richest country in the world. Individually. One man is worth a nation. Uganda is his position. Google. He's way richer than Uganda. Way one man. So when you see people say, hey, that guy is a rich man. <laughs> Bill Gates will laugh. So my question was, why would he do appropriate? And you see, they are also learning. Bill Gates tells you one of the most influential guys to influence him was a guy they used to call Chuck Feeney. Chuck Feeney was a guy who used to own the major um, duty-free markets. Eh? He's a guy who invented the duty-free mind, owned by an individual guy across the world. And Chuck Feeney always believed um, in giving. He always moved by the principle that every blessed man has an obligation. How true. How true. That's the book of Luke. That's the book of Luke. To whom much is given, much is required. He's actually telling you the principles that to whom much is given, much is required. So he says every blessed man in the world must have an obligation. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, thank you. For unto whosoever much is given, yes. Of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask more. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. So he's saying every rich man has a what? So back end, if I'm thinking I am rich, isn't the need of the church my obligation? If I am thinking I am rich. So you see that people don't give actually poor men, because they don't feel any obligation of what they have. And that is why when you read the story of man, that man, Chuck Finney, you'll still be shocked. He says, I always love to give. I always love to give. God loves a cheerful giver. I always love to give. I love, and he says, I love seeing things grow out of ground for the benefit of men. Fruit and, fruit, fruit and seed from the ground. You see his principle. Hospitals, schools, they're all for the benefit of what? Men. And therefore that guy gave out almost all his wealth. More than $7.5 billion. He just gave it. He just gave it. Chuck Fenny owns a small little Casio watch of $22. He rides in a train. Of course, he kept a few million dollars just for him. And he says by the time he dies, he just wants to live without money. He feels he's obliged because of his wealth. Bill Gates reads the story. He gets it in and he starts to increase. All these guys are reading it, the George Lucases, and they're starting to increase by the same principle. And they're not born again. 
and you Christian were telling you to tithe and you are not tithing. That's why I stopped tithing. I give more than tithe. Ask my father. I stopped. It's a very small life to live. It's a very small life to live. So a few years from now, some of you are going to see billion dollars in the ministry and you're going to talk too much. And you see, that's how it works. Simple. You see, let me tell you. There is a back end line of how these things work. Even if God has to distribute what should bring that money, he will distribute it. If it's revelation you want, he will distribute it. I saw a Christian building a facility of $400 million in Singapore. Christian, I said, this is, yeah, this is Christianity. $400 million. This is Christianity. This is Christianity. $400 million. He's just building a church facility. I said, this is Christianity. If a Christian can think this way, it's Christianity. But today, guy has a hundred million on the account. He's the one we call rich. We don't even know who are rich. So our definition, some of you, even your definition of rich is too lame, according to the scripture. But you can, a guy can even have 20 million on account, 40, 60, 100. And his attitude even in church changes. He feels he's rich. Then they give him front seats. I'm sorry, I'm coming, not saying too loud. A <laughs> hundred million. A hundred million. Then they treat them special, they do things, and then they go away with it. Why? Because they're the ones who are supporting. You know, I used to blame those men of God until I realized, okay, sometimes I'll not blame them in some instances. Why? Because the guy could have two wives and all, but he wants to build a church. And there's this funny guy who doesn't have two wives, he's very faithful in the ministry, but he doesn't even tithe. You get it? It's also silly. <laughs> and the man of God is also stuck because he's so die, so die in true principle. You see, when Pastor Isaiah says, even if you give or you don't give, it will be good. You know why he says that? He's not saying that proudly. We know how much we give. That's why we are very secure about the future of our ministry. Very sure. Because we know how much we give. Period. Therefore, we don't depend on the mercy of one individual. Even if you don't give, you see the church will still grow. Funnel will grow. You just see it growing. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Because it's not you. It's us. I'm, listen, Funnel's growth is entirely me. I must be a giver. I won't float principles and then expect that because I have a certain gift, certain... Listen. I've seen men who had people like that come into those windows and they left in the doors. Why? Because even if your gift will create room, it will not sustain your room. Sustaining your room comes with a certain price of the principles. You can't go back then. So, there are people who think they are rich. Yes, they are really poor, but they don't know that they are poor. Probably a guy has two, three billion dollars on his own account and he thinks, hey, that money can't even shake a vote in a district. So you, if you think that by having two, three billion shillings you're rich, then you don't know wealth. Here I was reading about uh, um, David Oedipo, and I was saying he's the richest pastor in the whole world. I said, wow, he's black. He's black. Thank God. It's happening in Africa. I saw the richest woman is Nigerian. I say, thank God it's happening in Africa. The man is worth probably more than $150 million. And he's black. He's building cities. Not houses. Not one little building like this. <laughs> Two bedrooms. And then you're the boss. Boss, hey, we didn't eat lunch. And saying, my you, did I give you money the other time? Hey, I'll, I'll fire <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I walked to the woman once who didn't know how many cars she had. For you, occurring with a boy for not cleaning the tire. But for us, she didn't know how many trucks she had. And she was right. Her dear, you didn't know how many cars she had. She didn't know. There were many trucks to count. She needed to sit down to count them because there were many. She just have to give you a rough estimate. For you, you had paper on your car. Then you come out of the car and you say, yeah, I'm a <laughs> That's why, you see, out of that life, I, that's why sometimes I despise men. Not in the bad way, but in the sense of the man who thinks he's rich, yes, he's not. That's not wealth. That's not money. That's not money. 
Just give us a few years. You'll understand what we're telling you. That's why it's good that we do it now. So that then you won't say, ah, no. When you see, you just say, mm, the guy used to say. Let me tell you, this church, this church is going to be the richest ministry in Africa. Whether you want it or not. It's beyond, we are hoping, no, we know the roadmap. And we are following it. Praise the Lord. One day we'll just change situations. You don't need 20 million people to do it, no. Just one day like this with the Lord. He said one day is better than a thousand. You get what I'm trying to tell you. You just need to arrest one day in the spirit realm like this. Just one day like this. Not one rich man, no. One day like this. That's why money is related to age, because time is saved. That's why I gave you one time, many of you, uh, some of you are here, I gave you a principle one time of uh, the poor house girl. A house girl makes 50,000 shillings. In the year, that's 600,000. In 10 years, that's 6 million. In 20 years, that's what? 12 million. Right? In, uh, in uh, 20 years? 20 years, that's what? 12, that's, and then in... Uh, in 30 years? 15. Eh? 15? 18. 18, thank you. And then in 4 years? In 40 years, sorry? 40 what? 24 what? Million. million. So that's someone who, their whole lifetime of 40 years, they've earned 24 million, which you can actually earn in one deal. You know what that means? That means that in one deal of one month, you've earned what one man will earn all their lifetime. Consequently, translated in the Bill Gates' mind, he has earned what nations are going to do in a hundred years. Uganda has been alive. I mean, Malaysia, uh, as some people, they had the Singapore was in the same place with Uganda 28 years ago. And they shifted from that place to first world. We're still third world. Singapore. Singapore. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uganda is still third world, and we are blaming the president. The church, all of these guys who are stealing, they have Christian names. They are not tithing, but they are robbing. They all have Christian names. I, all these guys you see impl implicated in, 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 in scams of government, majority have Christian names. They don't have Muslim names. No, Christian. But who raised them in the way they should go? When they, the church, the pastor had opportunity to teach them at that point, what were they teaching them? We missed them at that age. Now we're, we're raising another generation out of that. And it's going to have to sweat. Let me tell you something. We are pioneers of something. We're, this is a revolution. It's not just a simple Sunday service. And therefore our giving is going to determine too much of what's going to happen in this nation. Imagine each individual here was three billion shillings rich. Do you know would determine the next leader? And the other sectors that we determine, but no. They're telling you tight. I'm not sure. Tight. Tight has become a hard paper for you. Yet sharp training. A Roman Catholic man is faithful with giving to giving everything he had. You read all these guys, the Bill Gates, all of those guys, they say they don't want to leave their wealth to their children, they'll spoil them. But really they are saying the children must learn the principles that we have learned. They're just teaching those children the principles. But for us, what principle is in the life of the Christian? You ask a Christian and say they've been born again for 10 years and they don't even know fast fruit. They don't even know fast fruit. 10 years in the gospel. Say, ah, this is new. He says, this is new. It's new. Even the first fruit, they give it with pain. The first fruit of one month, they give for one week. And this is my first fruit. <laughs> I can't manage to give it three weeks. Come on, come on, come on. I would like to buy it. One time I went to a certain church. And I looked at them. They were very indebted. And I told them, you know what? You guys get a first fruit of one month. So all your collections, I just give it to your priest. I'm not your priest. Therefore, I'm just telling you the truth. And then they told me... Ah, it's a hard thing. And I told him, okay, I'll give you a week to think it through. I went to the Lord. I prayed. And the Lord told me they don't have the faith to. 
But because you have the money to sustain that kind of ministry for one month, give it to them. Only if they have the faith to give the first fruit. So I jokingly asked one of them, how much do you spend per month? They mentioned the certain amount. Of course, it was big but manageable. And I made up with my Lord. I said, I'm going to give it to them. Just wait to test them. After one week, I told them, uh-huh. so what did we resolve? He said, unless we give a week, but one month we can't. I said, God, thank you. I'm going to keep my money. <laughs> you see, the whole ministry should have been served by one principle, but they didn't see further to the God who gives because they think they're giving a poor God. God ain't poor, and he doesn't need your money. Mm-mm. But if he says do the principles, do them. Your life will be changed. Your life will be changed. Some of you even, that's why every time people come to me and they say, oh, I'm stuck. I, secrets, I tell them, have you listened to Secret of Brian Perjun? They say, no. I said, go listen to them. One time a guy came and told me, I listened to one, two, three, and asked him, is still stuck? Yeah. So what do you want? I said, he told me I want to know the mystery of money. I asked him, you've listened to all the three and you don't know? He said, no, I don't. I just want to know. So I asked him, do you type? He said, no. I told him, get out of here. I'll punch you. How can you listen to three CDs? You're not tithing and you want to know the mystery of money. What mystery? What should I explain? It's not anger. No, it's love. I love you too much not to stand you. How can <laughs> You see, the back end of this thing is, eh? let me say it in Luganda, and we've accepted that change. You get it? That's why someone say, oh, preach simpler messages. People don't understand your message. Who gave it to me? An entire human. I am. Now, the church has too much schedule. We, we, are, we have been pampered for so long that we don't even know anymore how to walk. You know like those babies who can walk, but they want to be correct. Uh, that's how some Christians are. <laughs> and you're also doing the same thing to your children. The girl is six years. You're laying in her bed. Really? And tomorrow you want your daughter to be responsible. At six, you're laying her bed. You laid it when she was two because you love her. That is a silly way to love. You're loving to spoil. No, six years old, darling, lay your bed because the first seven years for every child is obedience. If you miss to make your child obedient at the age of seven, I promise you, you're going to have trouble when they're a teenager. Because for me, that point is obedience, simple. Even when I was with my small nieces and my sister, they know me. I tell, simple, small thing, I tell Alexis, go get me that glass. But really, I, if I can get the glass, I just want her to know that when an old person sends you, you go. It's a few calories burnt, but it's going to produce something tomorrow in that woman. And then you see a silly parent say, why do you send my daughter? You have to get it. <laughs> Thank God my sister wasn't like that. So when I send, the girl has to go. My sister knows what I'm doing. She brings the glass. And I'm thinking, okay, obedience. If this girl makes 60, or 15, sorry, I tell her, go in your, she knows she will do it. But you kill it at 7 and think she'll honor you as a mother at all that. So your kids are failing and you think, you, hey children, it's you. It's you, you fail to put obedience in them. So by the age from 7 there, by the time you are supposed to coach, to the barb line of, uh, for seven years and then after that inspiration you can't inspire who isn't obedient and neither can you coach who wasn't inspired to obey. That's why kids are failing in our society and we're blaming everyone and those kids we're beating them but the problem was us. We didn't show them the way they should go. We just tell them the way they shouldn't go. Don't be around boys. Don't go to class. That's not the way. Show them the way. When you're giving in different places you understand? Carry your kid away. Put money in her pocket. Tell us, give. Let us see, give it. Let us see you give. You're teaching them to give. Because some of you are selfish. In high school, I had a kid. He told me, my father told me not to give. My mother, so he said, my mother. I said, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I told the mom, the, 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 the boy's mom. Eh. This is the mom's boy. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> Whichever English. He said, my father told my mother told me not to share. Your mother told you not to share. S1. I looked at that Obi grow up, particularly that Obi. Don't worry, the Muslim guy. I saw him grow up. A few months ago, he was at Sheraton. He was quarreling with his wife. The woman slapped him. Poor. 
And he's saying, I'm sorry. I said, eh, woman beating man. <laughs> I asked my boys, I said, Gwe, why was she beating? They said, no, no, she has all the money. <laughs> hey, now this is a true story. Adrian, I saw it. Now he's married to a woman who's written her name. She's slapping the hell out of him. And he can't do nothing. Why? His mama refused him to share. <laughs> Raise up a child. <laughs> no way he should grow. Teach your kids to share because, listen, they don't lose by giving. My mother is a giver. I'm a giver. I'm a giver because I've seen my mom give. And when a woman is selfish, it's what? <laughs> and, and that's why I tell you, if you've dated a woman for two, three years, and she has never spent on you, man of God, <laughs> I beseech thee by the mercies of God, And for us, giving is responsibility. I must provide for my house. For them, they're not mandated. They're entirely driven by love. That's why when a woman loves a man, she can even sell her shoe. The Bible says she considers a field and buys it. That's a woman of virtue. She must see a plot of land and say, I think we need it. But many of these women who are buying their present, supposing the man wants to check it. You even prepare him to be checked. You have your own plot of land and a house. I said they'll chuck you. They'll chuck you. You hide them, they'll chuck you. Why? Because you're, uh, you're providing for being chucked under certain circumstances. She considers a field and buys it. She shall do him good all his days. How can you love and not give for God so loved that he gave? It's the same principle of Christianity. You can't say you love a God who you don't give. That's what Corinthians says. That the brethren might know that you love. I think it's 2 Corinthians. Uh, that part of, 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 of giving, 8, I think. 9, 8. Yeah, it's 8. The last verse, I think, of 8. 2 Corinthians. Uh-uh, 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're coming back there. That's the rule of the same thing I want us to share. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I think it's in the last verse. I've, I've read it somewhere. 24. Thank you. One, two, three, let's go. Wherefore, uh huh, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. By what? You are stolen the church to give. And you give, you prove love. You prove love. You cannot love and not give. A man who doesn't give God is not a lover. He's pretending. You cannot love and not give. Because in this case, you're the woman. Christ's bride. You married a spouse to one, and the Bible says the man shall leave his own household, go be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. But this he spake concerning Christ and the church. Paul calls it the great mystery. Hallelujah. Have we, have we understood to that level? Now, let me share something about the four churches, and then we'll get, we'll get out of here. The difference of the stars. You can put a head in the difference of the stars. So the difference of the stars, I can relate to the church. I'm going to give you four churches. Eh? Read you a few scriptures and just show you the difference of those churches because consequently, the four churches represent the stars and their level and difference of glory. Why one church is richer than the other, why one Christian is richer than the other, yet both of them are what? Are giving. No, no, giving. Now we are talking about givers. We are not talking about people who are not even giving. 1 Thessalonians 2. The first church of and its glory was Thessalonia. Thessalonica, the church of Thessalonica. Thessalonians. The church of Thessalonica. Chapter 2, verse 7. Let's read. 1, 2, 3, let's go. Uh -huh. Paul says, but, 1, 2, 3, let's go. But we were gentle among you, uh -huh, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Uh -huh. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our souls because you were dear unto us. Next verse. So, for you, listen, remember, brethren, uh -huh, our labor uh -huh, 
and travail, uh -huh, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable, and to any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God. Give me the message version of this very verse, verse 9. Uh -huh. You remember us in those days, friends, working our fingers to the bone, our path, the night, moonlight, so you wouldn't have the burden of supporting us while we proclaim the gospel of the message. There are people, for example, I have been banking for seven years because then we were dealing with a church that was Thessalonica. They were babes and we had to nurse them like a mother cuddles her own child. We breastfed you. We taught you everything. And then after that, for some of you who know when we started this ministry, you realize that we spent everything. Let me tell you, machines were short of money. Poof. This was short of this. Poof. The hand was short of this. Poof. It's us. Why? Because we're dealing with a Thessalonica church. They were too baby to tell them give. They were too baby to tell them give. Because in that state of babiness, they don't even know. Their brain can't differentiate red and yellow. So that level, man of God, if you're in the church of Thessalonica, don't beg. Give. That's why some of you know everywhere I go in some certain poor churches, you know. We have always given to poor churches. You know that. Everywhere. I go, as a rule of the thumb, I always give poor churches. We either buy them chairs, we either buy them roofs. Why do we do that? Because we know they're babies. Or perhaps the people, the pastor is teaching, are babies. You know ministries where the pastor buys everything from machines to chairs to everything. There was a time we used to buy everything. Everything. I mean everything. So when we're dealing with the church at Thessalonica, or the Thessalonica Christian, we give them. That's why someone has the audacity to listen to me a whole sermon and tell me, Pastor, I don't have transport. I know that when it's Thessalonica, I'll give them transport. But how can I teach you the word? The Bible says in Galatians 6, 6, communicate to them that teach you the word in like, what? In all good things. Uh-huh. One, two, three, let's go. Let him that is taught in the word uh -huh, communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. That's the principle. When a man blesses you by teaching, bless them. You get it? On top of listening to my gospel, you're selling me your sack. It's like selling milk to a cow. It just doesn't make sense. But there's a Thessalonica. You teach a guy, he tells you I need transport. You get money, you give it to him. He goes. But because we're dealing with those kinds of people, for those of that time, we dealt with them at that level. And that is why many of you will share one testimony as a whole church. We have never begged any man. Because we're dealing with many Thessalonians. They can't see the need in the gospel. You see, let me help you understand. A mature Christian thinks this way. We need a crusade ground. We're going to do crusade in March. Your mind should be thinking, what am I going to do about this crusade? And I'm going to show you why the rule of the thumb will come later. That should come in your spirit. What am I supposed to do? It's not the 100,000. No. It's that 1,000 shillings you can have or 5,000 that will make a difference in your life. And then by faith, grow that until it becomes to a life of a person who gives big. But be faithful in that 1,000. That's why the Bible says, to whom is given little, even the little shall be taken away. There's that which gather it, but tend us to destruction. And there's that which scatter it, but tend us to increase. Some of you think you'll increase by saving. I swear you won't. We increase by giving. I said we increase by giving. Are you richer than Bill Gates? No, it should answer you. Don't tell me anybody less richer than Bill Gates to teach me. I want to learn from the best. Hallelujah. So that level also has its glory. That Christian has their glory. Now, they ask me for transport. I get that 5,000 I give it to them. It is testimony to them that they had transport at church. But if I should level their glory, their level of glory, they can't even afford transport. You get where I'm coming from? That is their level of what? Glory. They can't afford it. So, some of you, what you call testimony, <laughs> is actually a Thessalonica lifestyle. You have to beg for tuition. You have to beg for fees. Everything you're begging. If you don't beg, you don't get. 
So some of you what you call <laughs> testimony in Thessalonica living. You survive by those who you should bless. And you don't know the difference. You survive by those who you should bless. It should be who should be surviving on you. That one did not clap. Let me go to the second church. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> second church. Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 8. Chapter 8, sorry. Verse 7. Let's begin, uh, the, 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 let's begin with the verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 8. The second church is the church of Corinth. Let me show you the nature of them. Uh -huh. Listen to what Paul is telling them. Therefore, uh -huh, as you are bound in everything, uh -huh, in faith, in occurrence, uh -huh, in knowledge, in all diligence, in your love towards us, see that you also are bound in the grace also. The word abounding meaning stays. It means they are in it, but they are not steady in it. That's the second glory. The guy tights, but he's not steady tighter. The guy gives, but he's not a steady giver. Sometimes he... But you see, the funny thing also with these churches, they have everything, they know, mystery. They act a depth. Have you met men who are deep but broke? Eh? Yeah. Eh? Prophets who are accurate but broke? Eh? So you say, with every gift you have in you, you can't even, you can't even buy a shot. Me, the Lord sent me. Shut his stone here. And the guy is prophesying. So when they meet us prophesying and yet we are rich, they don't understand. Put your name also. <laughs> huh? So, uh -huh, next verse. So he tells them, abound in this grace also. That means they are not bounded yet. Uh -huh, next verse. I speak not, listen, by commandment. So we're not talking about the legal requirement here. But by occasion of the frowardness of others. And to prove the sincerity that's come back again of your love. So you think you love God because you've spent the whole overnight in prayer. No. No. If you're telling me we are going to spend the whole overnight in prayer because you're a choir person and you've dedicated your life to God and you've put up a serious spiritual faith and you're not tithing, shut up. <laughs> you're not. You're not a giver. <laughs> and you're saying, but you're deep. Shut up. They're like a starting vehicle. You know those poor intercessors? That's why I don't want them in church. I always tell people, this, this church, eh? there's a certain kind of intercessors we want, and we appoint them. I study you, realize you're a giver, you're deep in the word, now you can intercede for the church. But please, if you're poor and you're not a tithe, please don't intercede for us. Take those prayers. There are other churches which need them more than us. For us, we are big. You get my concept, eh? So some people think that's a pride. It's not a pride. No. It's a passion for us to speak and live truth. Because if the truth is not here, we will not set men free. It will not set men free. You know the truth. The Bible says that truth shall set you free. Uh-huh. So next verse, verse 9. Uh-huh. For you know, uh-huh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was what? But was what? For your sake. He became who or for your what? For your sake. Uh huh. That you through his poverty might be rich. Uh huh. That means you're not beginning a poor man, you're already rich. Uh huh. And then he says what? And here in I what? Give I my advice. For this is expedient for you who have begun before, not to only do, but also to be forward a year ago. They had promised some money a year ago and they had not yet fulfilled what they promised last year. Next verse. Uh -huh. Now therefore, listen, perform the doing of it that as there was a readiness to willing, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. Verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is acceptable according to that a man has and not according to that he has not. The guys who promised to give Paul something last year and then they've taken for a long year and then say, well, it's important that your mind is right and you have a right attitude. But why do you promise what you don't fulfill? Promise, you know, Christians, Christians who like pledging. I'm pledging a bicycle. <laughs> they love pledging big, but they never what? Fulfill. Again, they are not yet abounding in the grace of giving. 
You see, that also has its own glory. They can buy seas a bit. Sometimes they can survive out of a storm in April. Something like that. Eh? But they are never established. You remember last year I passed the prophetic word and I told you guys that the Lord has told us that let us give these three months. Which months were they? August, September, October. You remember those three years, man? No, three months. I saw, I saw famine. I saw the sun scorching heat and, and it was burning clothes of men. I said, Papa God, what is this? He says, that's the spirit of poverty. It's coming. August, September, October. It's going to be a hard month for men. Ask God, what should we do? He told us to give. We started giving. Ask my pastor. In those three months, I bought too much property. He knows that. Why did I get too much property in those three months? Because from then on, when I had the order in June, July, I started giving so big. He also knows that. Some of you I announced, it just passed like air. Now you're stuck because of consequences of October. You look on your accounts, they're all bleeding dry. You have nothing on your accounts. It's as though the money is in dollars. 20,000. 30,000. 3,000. You can think it's a dollar account. <laughs> a certain pastor listened to that CD, <laughs> came at the bank and gave me 200,000 and said, I want to sow. I heard that we should give. He gave me 200,000. <laughs> In that month, he fin built and finished the house. <laughs> and these Christians of ours, there's, I don't know what you people want. So you see that kind of life? They were not fulfilling what? Place. But you see, again, even in the lives when men are not fulfilling a place, we owe God an accountability in their weakness to cover, because love covers a multitude of sins. Go to chapter 9, verse 1. Listen to what Paul did when they didn't give. Mm -hmm. For as touching the minister into the saints, it's superfluous, superfluous for me to write to you next verse. Uh -huh. For I know, listen, again he has repeated, the frowardness of your mind, listen, for which I boast to them in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has provoked many. When Paul went to Macedonia, he didn't say, Can you believe the guys in Achaia don't give? They even promised me man and they didn't fulfill. That's wisdom. So when I'm outside, I don't tell people that my church doesn't give. I can say it internally, but I don't say it outside. Outside, I say, I have the biggest givers in church. That's what I say. But really, you are not givers, some of you, or many of you. But again, there's a mind that I owe God an accountability to say, that the communication of my faith, Philemon 1, 6, might become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in Christ. It's a good thing that they should be givers. Therefore, I claim them givers outside. It's also maturity. You don't go telling everyone who didn't fulfill. Leave it in your heart. But I've had men of God, so and so, promise me this. They didn't fulfill. Can you believe it? No, no. You boast that they promised. Boast that they promised. Stand in front of the and say, that guy is going to buy us this, hallelujah, if he doesn't, this problem. <laughs> we bought the fraudness of the minds of men and cover the weakness of those men. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Many people actually are in chapter, are in Corinthians, I've noticed. Because I remember that portion of scripture, of he that so it sparingly shall reap. And he that showed bountifully shall reap bountifully. And I realize that it's a Corinthian church that has to be told to give big. Or to be warned how much they are giving is. Eh? So also you, you're also in that class. Where you give little and you can't give big. You're also in that class. Corinthians chapter 9. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's also for those people. That given those people who give grudgingly. Let's read. Uh -huh. But he that what? So at what? Read. Sparingly shall what? Reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Next verse. Every man, listen, according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if you're a grudge, grudge giver, if you're a necessity giver, if you're under, give, you give under pressure, if sometimes you give little because you're not sure that that 10,000 will sustain you, so you give only two for you to, to, to keep the other eight and you can't have faith to give eight and keep two. You're also in that class. Classify yourself. Third, third praise the Lord. Third church, Philippians, chapter 4. Verse 15. Very quickly, I want to get out of here. Huh? Read. 
Now, uh -huh, you Philippians uh -huh, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, uh -huh, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but only you. That means when he left Macedonia and went outside, the church in Philippians started to give, okay, to give to Paul. Listen, uh -huh. for ye even, even in Thessalonica, listen, you sent once and again, and to my necessity. Why are they sending help in Thessalonica? They are babies. You get the point, eh? So, Paul is receiving from Thessalonica, I mean from Philippe in Thessalonica. Huh? In Thessalonica. Thessalonica looks at Paul rich and they don't what? They don't give. You get that concept? That concept. Next verse. Uh -huh. Not uh -huh, because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that might what? Abound to your account. Next verse. But I have all, but I have all and what? And abound. So that means they were not giving a poor guy. Paul had money. That's the thing. Men of God, we have to be rich before they give us. We have to be rich. Huh? So he says, but I have all and abound. I am full, uh -huh, having received all Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you. That means Philippians church gave Paul everything he wanted. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, I know of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Next verse. Uh -huh. But my God, now listen to the promise in the church in Thessalonica. He says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ. This is to the church in Philippi. Thessalonica is claiming that promise. Corinth is claiming that promise. My God shall supply. You know when we're preaching sometimes I say, and your God shall supply. Then you see people, Whoa! you see Thessalonica jumping. And a few Corinth. According to his riches in God, he even gets slain. Bah! <laughs> and then he says it is drama. <laughs> really? Tell your neighbor that's to Philippe. Why? Because they consistently supplied all the needs of the church. Last church. <laughs> so bless yourself. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. Let's go back to Corinth. Chapter eight, verse one. That's the first church. Okay, let's read. Uh huh. Verse one. You're in nineteen. Uh huh. Uh huh. Let's read. Moreover, listen, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. Listen bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. There was something special about the church of Macedonia. I realized that when he's talking to Philippians, he's saying, no church communicated to me when I came from Macedonia. Except you guys. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Because in Macedonia, it was a different experience. Huh? Now, the Bible says here, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, uh -huh, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Listen to the grace on them. Next verse. How but in a great trial of affliction, the abundance, listen, of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They were poor but free men to give. Next verse. For to their power, uh -huh, I bear record here, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Next, next line. Uh -huh. Praying us with much entreaty, that would receive the gift. They were pleading with the, with the apostles to receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Next verse. Uh -huh. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves to God and to the men of God by the will of God. So they were submitted and then they were poor guys and then they gave... And then after giving, they gave more than was expected. They gave everything, even in their poverty. And not only that, they looked at it as a blessing for them to give. They pleaded. Some of you help men of God like you are. Not sure this is what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. He thinks it's helping. 
That's a Corinth guy. <laughs> he thinks he's blessing the pastor. He's not blessing the pastor. It's our obligation to bless him. Me, it's my obligation. Me, it's my obligation to bless my father. Period. That, there's no sense in there. It's my what? Obligation. But look at how they went past themselves. There are even people who are now past tight. They're past tight. You see a guy giving more than tight. He contributes in everything at church. And he's also singing. Everything about his life is God. That's a different man. And if you read from those four churches, you realize Thessalonica, Corinth, Philippe, uh, Macedonia is 0, 30, 4, 60, 4, 100 fold. Very simple. Thessalonica has no fold. Corinth has 30 fold. Philippe has 60 fold. And Macedonia has 100 fold. By the time Paul left ministry, Macedonia was the richest church. It was the richest. Because they were what? They were givers. I have a lot to say, but let me just finish there. It, I still realize there is a lot to say. I'll, I'll put part five. I'll put part five. This month, eh? This month, I'll, I'll put part five. I... Because I realized I've just preached half of the message. So allow me to give it a sixth part. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Then after that kind of someone, you choose which church <laughs> you want to be in. So <laughs> Go to your business, assess it. Is it Thessalonica or Corinthic or <laughs> Philippianic or Macedonic? You, you choose. You choose. You choose which fold you want. Now, if after hearing this, you still struggle with tithe, I ran out of the grave. In fact, sometimes when it comes to this message, I become a bit legal. Because I've been poor. I know what it feels like. It's fake. Even fake a laughter. Because you're laughing next to a rich man. It's not even coming from your heart, but you have to laugh. I'll give you transport. <laughs> then you call someone and then they don't help you and then you feel bad and you say, why hasn't that person helped me? What is a Christian asking for? A deodorant. They refuse to give him money for a deodorant and he got pissed. Now, if you don't understand that I'm trying to get you out of that life, I have no kind words for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Speak to God. <laughs> Classify yourselves. In whichever school you are, some of you are not even Thessalonica. You're not even in chat. You also have your class. <laughs> speak to God. Just speak to God. Depending on your church. If you're Macedonia, thank God you're Macedonian. If you're Philippe, thank God you're Philippe. If you're Corinth, ask God to grow you through Philippe and Macedonia. If you are Thessalonica, repent. For you, it's repenting. And a few Corinthian fellows, you have to repent. Speak to God and tell him, God, I'm sorry. I, I am sorry. Tell him, God, I'm sorry. You just tell him, I am sorry. Tell him, I am sorry. That's it. Just tell him, I am sorry. You, you don't even need to have science in it, whether you're under grace or law. Just tell him, God, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't. Because now you've realized you are responsible for your success and you have failed yourself. It's not Jehovah God refusing to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. No, you refuse to get into the church. You refused the church. You refused it. Now you speak to your God and ask him to help you. Ask him to help you. And from today, 
you learn to be a giver. It doesn't matter what happens, you learn to be a giver. You learn to be a giver. You learn to be a giver. Shile baranda rabaza katala. Jile boroboko zile maranda ribokori handala za katala. Jalaba rimoronde rekere brosige kende ke jile kele paranda la la bajile. Jile kele brosoko tanda je mandala kare bori katande le vele. Jile po brosi boko tiki pandala kalike pronde la kastili ke korgia kumoronda. Nino porolanda la havile kasi le brosotea. God help us. 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 In Jesus' name. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest.